at a workshop, we were asked to put name boards for ourselves. This is what I wrote. Priyanka V. Pandit, Passionate Chaos Coordinator. During all the breaks and at the end of the workshop, everyone wanted to know who I am and what I do. So what do I do? Let me try and explain this with the help of some examples. In my line of work, I come across people from varied walks of life. Some, if not all, seek my advice. Advice on the peculiar situation that they're in and their situation being disputes. If you've ever been in a dispute or are privy to one, you are aware of the whirlwind that they can cause in our lives. Personally, professionally, emotionally, mentally, financially, it's absolute chaos. Chaos that you can't beat and chaos that you can't put behind. So what can you do? You can try to manage it, or as I say, you can try to coordinate it. And that's where counsels for disputes or passionate chaos coordinators like myself come in. As a young law graduate, my mind was flushed with all the rules, codes, norms, and laws that we had been so rigorously fed throughout our course. The knowledge was all boxed in. So on my first day as a chamber junior, when I was asked to go to court and take a date, I thought this was fairly simple and could be achieved. I went to court, respectfully told the judge that I needed a date because my senior was not available, and I was given a date and I walked out of court. It felt like a walk in the park, and I was reasonably pleased with myself. So the next day in another matter, when I was asked to go and take an adjournment because we were waiting for client instructions, I thought this was going to be very easy. Little did I know what was going to happen. When my matter was called and I told the judge that we needed a date because we were waiting for client instructions, and as he heard me patiently for about five, 10 seconds, I thought he needed some time to give me a date by looking at his diary. But what he said next, shook the ground beneath my feet. He said that my matter is going to be rejected. He's going to dismiss my case because it's not maintainable in law. To make my shock worse, he made me read out loud a section from his book in open court. That 30 second pause in this AC courtroom where only senior advocates were sitting at the table felt like time moving at glacial pace. And my heart and mind were racing for a response any response, and that's when it happened, my eureka moment. I looked at the judge and I said, that even if I had to make an application to show how he should not dismiss my case, I would need time, and therefore, he must give me a date in justice. With a sly and stern smile, I got my date, but as I walked out of that court, I tried to digest what had happened. This was not law. This was not knowledge. This was not training. It was thinking on my feet and out of the box. I find the intersection between law and creativity absolutely fascinating. You see, in the realm of law, creativity is not mere luxury. It's a necessity. Every case presents itself with unique challenges, human components, and demands an innovative approach. In a civil case, or a criminal trial, or in family disputes. A creative approach can allow you to arrive at solutions which conventional methods might overlook. Let me try and explain this with another example. An investigation agency arrested an accused who had stolen some gold biscuits. But before these gold biscuits could be seized, the biscuits were melted and converted into jewelry. Now this jewelry remained in the court's custody for years. And every time the owner of this gold tried to make an application to get his jewelry back, the judge rejected it, saying, prove that this jewelry was made from your gold. This seemed impossible for him to do. After many unsuccessful attempts, when I was briefed and asked to step into the matter, I only did one thing. I called for the investigation officer to become to be brought to court for an examination. The judge looked confused. He even asked me whether I was representing the accused or the owner of the gold. I promised him that this was relevant and I would show how. I asked the investigation officer to tell us why and how he had 
sees this particular goal jewelry. At the end of my examination, I had a detailed answer on record. And just before the court judge could move on to the next matter, I quietly moved an application before him, seeking return of the seized gold jewelry. The judge looked at me and said, Madam, this is the eighth time your client is trying to make this application. You know I'm going to reject it. I looked at him and I said, yes, but today, this investigation officer has done for my client what he couldn't do the last seven times. This investigation officer in his answer has proved that the seized jewelry was made from the stolen gold. After a hearty laugh, we walked out of court because our application was allowed and we had golden smiles. So you see, it's not just about knowing the law or knowing your facts. It's also about thinking creatively and going through the seeming chaos to find an unconventional answer and challenge your limitations. Because it is our ability to challenge what has been laid down and put to test what has been said that allows us to thrive, survive, and move beyond challenges and limitations. I recently stumbled upon the laws of chaos. Sounds paradoxical, doesn't it? Well, it is our ability to make rules and norms around everything that defines us as human beings. And our case laws are a prime example of exactly this. Our case laws don't just interpret the law. They also have the power to create the law or read meaning into what was purposed. For example, like the McDonald's hot coffee case, which ensured that we aren't served beverages that are too hot to handle, or Puttaswami that confirmed our right to privacy and our right to be forgotten, or Vishakha versus the state of Rajasthan, which created guidelines for prevention of sexual harassment at the workplace when none existed, or Navtet Singh Johar, that allowed us to see privacy between consenting adults in a private space in new light. So now I want you all to close your eyes for 10 seconds and think about a creative example. Go ahead, close your eyes for 10 seconds and think, what's your best creative example? Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, you're supposed to do this after my talk. I still need some more attention from you now. Let's look at some more examples of creative thinking. Let's look at alternate dispute resolution mechanisms. My personal favorite is mediation. Mediation is a process that empowers the parties to come up with solutions to their own problems by using unconventional methods and then bind themselves in a settlement agreement. But mediation also does something that perhaps no other legal process does. It allows the parties to vent. Now this may seem unconnected and unimportant, but it really nips the bud of the problem. You see, in every dispute, there is invariably a feeling of having suffered some loss. And mediation allows you to address that feeling. But in the words of Aristotle, what is law? Law is reason, free from passion. But in the process of mediation, this need not be so. And that is a creative approach to coming to a resolution. Let's look at another example of creative thinking, technology in law and the impact that it has on our lives. Technology is now enabling us to solve problems across borders and work seamlessly to find meaningful, meaningful solutions. Big files have now become compact PDFs. Huge briefs have now become small files on a computer. Our hearings are virtual, meeting events, conferences, everything is virtual. Access is open to all, data is becoming the new currency, and our bedrooms are becoming the new remote office. In the age of reg tech and legal tech, AI platforms and chatbots, what used to be mammoth and time consuming tasks are now being seamlessly executed. Thinking out of the box is solving problems large and small. And you are witness to what thinking out of the box can do. So my future, I speak to you now. What in my talk has inspired you today? Have you learned to see something differently? Let me leave you with these two thoughts. Thinking creatively is important, but sometimes the solution may not be thinking out of the box. It may not be about thinking inside the box. It could simply be to think about the box. So when we face a challenge, 
and it seems like there's no way to go about it. What can we do? We think. And we think creatively because it's not illegal yet. Thank you.